This is Star Talk Sports Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist and sports enthusiast. But I'm not enough to hold this show. I need my co host, Gary, former professional footballer in the UK. Hi, Neil. Welcome back to the show, dude. Thank you. Yeah. And how long have you been in, in the United States? Um, depends who you ask. I think mm. it ranges no. from too, no. too the real, long. The real, the real question is, how long have you been here legally? <laughs> oh, <laughs> legal. I have always been here legally. So uh, okay. uh, that's, that's the good news. And yeah. that other voice popped up. Chuck Nice. Always good to have you, man. Always good to be here. The I just want to say absolutely uh, nothing. I was delighted Ooh. to host your family for the weekend. And when we did... One early morning, you asked me for a jump rope. You went over to the side, and you worked out with a jump rope. And I was so impressed by that, only to then realize you never really did any sports your whole life. Yes. Um, however, double dutch is a sport. <laughs> is that in the Olympics? We're going to see that in Paris. So. Yeah, I, I think double dutch requires three people. <laughs> Chuck, <laughs> you can't double dutch with yourself. That's how good I am. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Gary, what do you have in store for us today? Okay, this would be interesting, if not fascinating, 10-pin bowling. They say, right, but bowling, to get a perfect game means you score over 300. This is regular bowling. You said 10-pin. That's just regular bowling, right? That's 10-pin bowling, as opposed to crown green bowling, which is done on grass and all the others. Or lawn bowling. There you go. So if you have an average over 200, it's considered as an accurate indicator of a misspent youth. (laughs) <laughs> and it's, a, it's, also, it's also an indicator that this person may well understand more physics than you think. Imagine, right? You're there on the lane with a ball in hand. You're discussing Euler's equations of motion whilst chewing the fat about radius of gyration, all whilst wearing some dang ugly shoes that don't fit too good. And uh, it's actually said, Chuck, and you'll love this, if you learn to read the oil patterns in the lane, you could find yourself with the cheat codes for a perfect game. And we must get into how that can work out for us. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I haven't played, I haven't bowled in many, many years, primarily because it's become a place where yuppies go to drink. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it used to be, you know, like, I used to be in a league. Saturday morning, you went out, you bowled, it was great. Now you can't get a lane because it's a bunch of yuppies sitting around day drinking. Well, is yuppie still even a word? Is a language? Oh, they, language? they're still they're still around. No, I know they still yeah. exist, oh, no, but no, is it a no, word? No, you're right. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> just they're not. No, written, no, Neil, you're right. They're not yuppies anymore. They're hipsters. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I got it. Yeah, they're hipsters. Okay, so Gary, who 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 do you have? who possibly has this kind of expertise? Well, surprisingly enough, he's a guest who's been on before. We what? knew him as, yes, Dr. Dave, the pool hustler. Ah. He's now going, he's going to return today as Dr. Dave, Lord of the Lanes, um, <laughs> because uh, he he has some serious chops. He's bowled a perfect game. He, has, he still has an average over 200. And you know what? Even I could work out he was the guy to talk to. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Dave, welcome back to Star Talk. Thanks, Neil. It's great to be back. Oh my mm. gosh, I love calling Doctor Dave. I love that. Just yeah. uh, it's just it's it's affectionate. It's more affectionate than just Dave. You know, Doctor Dave. So yeah. you recently retired professor emeritus. You don't look that old at Colorado State University. Got your PhD in mechanical engineering at UT Austin. And I met my wife at UT Austin, by the way, uh, the woman who would become my wife. And you you got your own YouTube channel and. Facebook page dedicated to pool. We knew that, but also to billiards. So, so you're the man, you the man. And so let me ask you in your misspent childhood, how did bowling become part of this as well? Well, my, my early life dream was to be the Dr. Dave of bowling instead of the Dr. Dave of fool. All right. <laughs> Cause I, really? yeah, I, I grew up, I basically grew up in a bowling alley. My, my mom worked at a bowling alley and luckily wow. that bowling alley also had a pool hall in it. So it was just, it was just bliss heavenly bliss for me even as a child <laughs> uh, so, so which are you better at um i'm probably uh people probably consider me a little bit better in the billiards but but i'm a strong bowler as well wow. what constitutes a strong bowler i mean I, I, it would have to come down to the numbers of your average yeah of course so what is the average that creates a strong bowler anything over 200 like gary mentioned is, is considered strong but uh you know i've averaged close to 220 i'm averaging about 220 right now 
Mm-hmm. Partly because I got a brand new bowling ball, which we're going to talk about later. That helped wow. me boost my average. Right on, right on. Oh, man, that means yeah. you got the uh, fingers drilled for yourself. Wow. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, that's a good really? feeling. Right? You take the ball and it's just a big ball. It's, it's a sphere. And you got to go in and they drill the holes just for you. So, so, so Dave, uh, in my uh, engineering physics classes, I remember learning all about sort of Euler angles and uh, sort of the geometry of a rotating coordinate system. And my notes here tell me that uh, Euler, Euler is a, a famous British mathematician from uh, a century gone by, <laughs> that you somehow invoke Euler equations to bowl a 300. I, 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 you got to get me, get me on that same page here, please. That well, is I awesome. Don't, honestly, I don't use the math when I bowl, but the math does affect the physics on the lane. Uh, the Euler's oh. equations, Euler, Euler did many things, but one thing he contributed to dynamics is the Euler's equations of motion that describe gyroscopic effects. And these new bowling balls take advantage of these gyroscopic effects. Oh, well, okay. and I'm going to be very honest because I don't care when I look ignorant because it happens all of the time. <laughs> I, I thought the Euler lanes were... The greasy spots on the floor. <laughs> I actually, I actually thought maybe there are slick spots on the lane itself. Okay, this is spelled cut. E-U-L-E-R. Euler. I had no idea. Yeah. Or maybe Euler. Maybe Euler was the first guy that oiled the lane, so they call him the Euler. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so it's Euler. E-U-L-E-R. Okay. Yes. So, so, so here's so, an interesting, an oh. interesting observation, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, to because. Because Gary is is going to drill you for the whole hour we got here. Okay. So <laughs> so, um, what I remembered most about the Euler equations in my sort of engineering physics was normally when we think of something rotating, we think of only one axis, and so Earth is rotating, or or a top is rotating that is spinning. But if you have rotation in more than one axis simultaneously, mm. then interesting things happen. Right, so 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 here here's the ball trying to roll down the lane, and so that's an axis of rotation. It's rolling, but then you put a little spin on it on top of the rolling that's happening, and so the ball doesn't go in a straight line; it curves. So, are you telling me you thought all this out, and you and, and really, really, and it's not just practice? <laughs> well, to play the game well, it's all about practice. But, uh, you know, good bowlers take advantage of the oil patterns, which we can talk about. And the ball, the, ball, the ball manufacturers take advantage of these gyroscopic effects. So if you had a homogeneous ball, a solid sphere, it has holes in it, but let's forget that for now. <laughs> and you spin it and you throw it down the lane, it's going to spin on the same circumference the whole way down the lane. And this is actually, uh, this is actually directly from billiards. When we looked at the Massey shot, a Massey shot in billiards is the same as a curveball in, in bowling. All right. Now, if the ball is a sphere, a solid sphere, when it's when it's trying to curve, it's spinning. And uh, Coriolis figured out that 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 uh, the direction of the friction does not change during the curve. Same thing in a, on a pool table. So that, what that what that uh, suggests is that a stripe of oil is going to build up on that ball along one circumference. You get a circle of oil building up on the ball as it's traveling down the lane. Now that's bad because the oil is slick. Well, he's it, so he is hits, literally talking about oil, Chuck. There is oh. oil on the lanes. It's actually a petroleum product. <laughs> it's not oh. crude oil. It's actually mineral oil based, but it's a oh. very, very clean looking oil, but it's, it's slick. How okay, so, so, so Chuck, you were even wrong in your ignorance. That's pretty bad. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> uh, if, what can Neil, I say? This is where I'm a Viking. This is where I'm a Viking, Neil. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> right, so, go ahead, so Dave. You gotta, be, yeah. you gotta be good at something. Okay. <laughs> Even if it's good at being wrong. <laughs> All right, Dave, so, I mean, we've got multiple axes of rotation and that's all happening. But to drive this, apart from the bowl of themselves, you've got a weight block inside. Now, they come in A, different shapes, and they're not all asymmetrical. They're offset as well, aren't they? Yes. So how is that then impacting on these Euler's equations of motion and uh, how, how the ball does its thing? That's the critical piece here. So again, if you have that solid ball that doesn't have this weight block in it, it builds up the stripe of oil. Now the oil is not consistent over the whole length of the lane. They put most of the oil at the, at the, in the first two thirds of the lane. The last third is mostly dry. It has a little bit of oil. That's where most of the curve occurs in the last third of the lane. But if the ball is picking up oil the whole way down the lane, it's going to slide more during that curve section. All right. So these weight blocks, it's asymmetric. 
as Neil's pointed out, if you have a ball, you're spinning at about one axis. It's moving down the lane. Friction is creating a torque or moment about another axis. That causes this weird wobbling effect. The ball actually does this weird wobble thing. You can see me on video what I'm doing, but it gives you like different circles of oil on the ball so that new ball surface is touching the lane the whole way down. So it doesn't build up oil on one stripe. And when it hits the drier part of the lane, it has, it has virgin, virgin olive oil. <laughs> it has a virgin oil-free surface mm. to, uh, to help it curve more. So Dave, let me get, if I understand this correctly, the first part of the journey of the ball is on oilier, it's an oilier surface than the last section. Yes. So where it's oily, you're not going to get much friction to curve the path. Is, is that correct? Bingo. Okay. So I always wondered why the ball curved more in the last... I've seen this and yeah. I never understood why. So that's it why. It breaks hard. It breaks harder. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, bowlers call that the back end. You want to have Ooh. a strong back end where Ooh. it curves hard and, and creates a good entry angle into the pins, which we can talk about later also. If we've spent enough time and, and sort of examined bowling and come to the conclusion that Euler's equations of motions are involved, surely now there has to be an optimal speed, an optimal angle of approach, because otherwise I'm sticking that straight in the gutter. And we've got this configuration of pins, this triangular configuration, and we've all seen it. What would say the seven and a ten split where one the two furthest pins away from each other are left and you've got a spare to try and clear them up. So how do I get out of that by using a bit of science by thinking, right, there's an optimal speed, there's an optimal angle of approach, or am, am I daydreaming again? No, you're right on, right on topic. Let's talk about the pin numbering briefly because I'm going to refer to them at times. So the pins mm -hmm. are in a triangle pattern. The head pin, the, the one in front, is called the one pin. Mm, but then, that is then they're numbered. so, so surprising. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then the number, this is surprising too. The next row is two and three. Then it goes four, <laughs> five, six. Then it goes seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. All right, so Gary just mentioned the seven, ten split. That's a bowler's, a bowler's nightmare. You have the, the far two pins in the corners uh, that you leave as a spare. And it's pretty much impossible to convert, but it, but it can be made mostly through luck. But let's getting back, getting back to a strike. How does a bowler give themselves the best chance of getting a strike. You might think, throw it right down the middle and hit that head pin right in the center. Well, that's the worst possible thing you can do. But that's what most beginner bowlers try. They try to throw it in the middle. No, I think a gutter shot is worse than hitting the front pin. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, of all the worst things you could do, I, I'm thinking a gutter shot is worse, but, <laughs> but go on. That's right. But if you throw it straight, you want it to hit off center slightly. That's how you can get a strike. But the problem is when it comes in straight, the ball deflects off the pins a little too much and it doesn't have enough power to drive through the center. And you often leave what's called the five pin, the one in the middle. Or sometimes you'll leave a, a 10 pin on the, on the far corner because the ball's not coming in strong enough to send the other pins toward the 10. All right, so bowler, they want to come in at an exact six degree entry angle. All right, this isn't random. Wow. There's been, six, there's been extensive testing, extensive testing, lots of simulations. Chuck, that was my problem. I was angle. coming in at seven degrees the whole yeah, time. And, and I was five and a half. <laughs> well, Neil, 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 that's your problem, man. That's your problem. Seven oh, degrees man. is not six. Oh, it's not oh, six. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you you were doing seven minute abs instead of six minute abs. <laughs> now, you might think a, a bigger angle is better. Like, you might think, if I can get seven, isn't that better than six? Well, at, at some point, it's coming into the, into the pins a little too steep, and it just kind of kind of tunnels through and doesn't doesn't spread them as well. So people have found this six degree angle to be kind of optimal. It sounds like a small angle, but you have to curve it a fair amount because it's only curving in that last part of the lane and the lane is really long and skinny. So to get an angle, you have to curve it significantly. Yeah, and, and is that the pocket that you always hear them talk about? Bingo, for a right-hander, it, it's called yeah. the, one, the one three pocket. You're hitting the one and three pins uh, at the, uh, first. And it's also called the Manhattan side. You don't want to go to the Brooklyn side. That's kind of embarrassing to a good bowler. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, uh. the term came from, you know, people in Manhattan, they have to cross over the bridge to get to Brooklyn. All right. All right. So, so now if you cross is, over, you cross the, over the head pin, you're hitting the left side. That means you weren't very accurate. You're hitting a, on the Brooklyn side, we call it. So is the gutter the Jersey side? What's, no! the, what's, what's up? What's up? Chuck, Tell the truth. Chuck, what's, what's going Chuck. on? So what, what if I just get brute force and ignorance to start bowling and just barrel one down there is it would it just be simple enough to just say it's velocity or are we into spin rates and you know if i want to get this angle of approach and we're playing with a lane that isn't uniform from start to finish you bring up a good point because that entry angle is critical 
But the other crit crit critical thing is momentum. You know, the weight of the ball and the speed of the ball both contribute to the to the to your pin action. How well you you bust up those pins. So if you can throw a heavier ball faster, it's going to help. Assuming you can get that angle, which is harder. The faster you throw it, the more difficult the more difficult it is to curve it enough to get that angle. Uh, but if you can if you can spin a lot, so bowlers want a lot of rev rate. You know, uh, good bowlers, top pros, they can they can spin the ball almost 10 revolutions a second. So it's a, it's a pretty fast spin. Yeah. So you want to spin them as much as you can so you can throw it as fast as you can and still get that six degree entry angle. That's the, that's the secret sauce of bowling. Are you, are you saying that if a person is weaker, they have to use a lighter bowling ball and all other things being equal, they will not be as successful at bowling because they're using a, a, a ball with less mass. Now, some pros, you know, uh, 16 pounds is the maximum allowed weight. And for, for many years, all pros use 16 pounders. But now they're migrating closer to 15. And you might think, well, why are they giving up that, that free momentum? Well, they can throw the 15 ball, 15 pound ball faster. Okay. So they can actually get, and they can spin it more. So it's a trade off between the kinetic energy of its speed and the momentum you get from its mass, I guess. There's two of those. Uh, well, again, operating. the main thing you want is momentum. You want, you want mass or weight and you want speed. Mm -hmm. You want both. Okay. But, Here's yeah. something that I thought was happening and maybe not. And then we're going to take mm -hmm. a quick break and we'll come back and pick this up some more. Uh, does the spin, this picking up on what Gary said, does the spin of the ball, other than altering its direction of impact, does it help uh, uh, knock a pin sideways better rather than bowl it down forward and help to create more sideways action, helping mm. you get those side pins mm. a little better? Is that is that a thing? Uh, not really, because most 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 bowling shots you have three three kind of phases. You have the slide phase, where it's just sl it's spinning like mad, but sliding through the oil, very little friction. It's curving just a slight amount. Then you have the uh, the curve phase, where the friction is really grabbing and it's changing the direction of the ball. And during that curve phase, it's actually losing that's the side spin. And it, when it's done with the curve phase, it's actually mostly rolling. Mostly oh. rolling in a straight line at the desired angle at the end. So it has very little uh, excess spin left over when it's hitting I the I forgot pins. that. Of course, if you're spinning it and it's responding to that spin by friction, it's slowing down that spin. Of course, that's going to happen. Yes. Wow. Okay, guys, we've got to take a quick break. But when we come back, more on how to bowl a 300 in 10-pin bowling on Star Talk Sports Edition. We're back. Star Talk Sports Edition. We're talking about bowling, how to be good at bowling. No, how to be perfect at bowling. There is such a thing as perfect. You bowl a 300. And our special guest today, Dr. Dave Alcitor. Did I pronounce your name correctly, sir? Uh, right on. Right on. For, my, for, for the French side of my family, but the Italian side of my family likes Alcitore. Alcitore. I mm. way prefer that, but I don't want to offend the French side. Um, Dr. Dave, we've had you on before talking about billiards, and that was a fascinating show, one of my favorites, and only to learn that you have further expertise, because part, part of your childhood, you grew up in a pool hall, because your mother worked there. So that, that meant you play, uh, uh, you grew up in a billiard hall, which also had pool tables, but that meant you, you got free games. That probably what that meant. Oh, yeah. So you maybe, you're right. good, maybe you're good at, at bowling because you played for free. Not because you actually studied the equations. Now, fess up. It, yeah, it can Are you be telling me I got a free ride, Neil? You're telling me yeah. I got a free ride, man? <laughs> <laughs> Confess your privileges here, right? This is what we got to do. So, so tell me more. You mentioned this oil on the, you know, none of us are thinking that there's oil on the, none of us non experts are thinking that anyway. Could you just give us a little more details about why is there oil there and how you have come to exploit that fact? And why don't you guys just get a rag? <laughs> okay. Well, there is there is a form of rag in the automated machine that puts down the oil. This is a computerized machine that puts the oil down uh, in certain patterns, and it's not always the same pattern. Um, typically, in a league situation, they they give us a fairly easy pattern. An easy pattern is where most of the oil is in the middle, and then the oil doesn't go down a lane as far. All right, that's the optimal situation. Uh, and one reason is. If you throw the ball across the oil, like from the left, if you're right-handed, you'll start to the left a little bit. If you throw it across the oil, it goes out. If you throw it out too far, it gets to the dry part of the lane sooner, and then it curves more. 
Right. If you don't throw it out far enough, it stays in the oil and slides. And that's how you optimize your chances to get a strike. Mm -hmm. You have strategy based on how the oil's put down. The optimal wait, wait, when strategy. When you said throw it out, you mean the distance between where you release the ball and where it hits the wood? Well, that is one variable that some people adjust, but mostly, I mean, you're throwing it more to the right. If you're right-handed okay. and you throw it more to the right, it hits the drier part of the lane sooner. Okay. And that lets it curve sooner and you can still get a strike. You yeah. throw it too far to the left, it stays in the oil and doesn't, and doesn't curve as much and you can still get a strike. So you can be sometimes, if, you're, if you have your optimal strategy for, for the oil pattern and you're throwing it in the best possible place, you give yourself the widest margin for error, sometimes as much as like six inches, six to 10 inches. Wow. You can be off by that much and still get a strike. And, so, and, and how, how much does alcohol come into play <laughs> when making these calculations <laughs> mentally? Well, people that tend to get tense, alcohol is actually a, a booster because it helps them relax a little bit. Well, excellent. But that only works for, to a point. And then there's, guess, there's a difference between perceived and actual performance, Chuck. Of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That well, alcohol you makes, you, makes your perceived performance amazing. Right. <laughs> you well, think clear, you, you clear, think clearly you've been to one of my comedy shows. <laughs> That's right. So, so Gary, he's he's all yours, Gary. Take all it. right. So I have to I have to imagine now I'm bowling, but the pattern of oil that's been laid down in the lane isn't fixed. It's going to change that every time a bowl goes down it. So now I've got an organic situation that's changing in front of me. So is it is it kind of like a major cheat code once I learn how to read the pattern? read the oil movement as balls, balls go down it and then distribute oil in different places on the lane? Well, there's three things there, Gary. One is you have to know what the pattern of oil is. You know, they yeah. put down different patterns in, on diff in different lanes or in pro tournaments, they actually put down a different pattern on each of the two lanes that they're bowling on just to make it more challenging. And they have, oh. sometimes they use a totally different ball and sometimes they, they stand in a totally different place and throw it with a totally different speed and direction on each of those two lanes. That's the ultimate challenge. Wow. But again, in the league, wow. they're putting down pretty much the same pattern for us every week. And you know, I've learned to find the optimal way to throw the ball to give myself the best chance of getting a high score. And, and um, how now, many balls? How many balls are you able to use if you're playing like a real tournament game? Can you say, okay, for my spares, I'm going to have a lighter ball or, or a heavier ball. Uh, for my first throw, I'm going to use a lighter ball, and then I have my second lane ball. I mean, are what are there rules? No, there's no limits on the number of balls you can use. In fact, a pro, they might have, it might sound ridiculous, but they might have like 15 to 20 balls at, uh, you know, available and they might change balls in the middle of a match, you know, if, if it's not working out or if they're, reading, if they're reading something in the oil pattern that, that they didn't anticipate. So there's no limit on the number of balls. So imagine <laughs> carrying a golf ball, a golf, a golf bag, a golf bag full of these bowling balls around. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but typically <laughs> most league bowlers, they have like uh, their, their strike ball, their curve ball, and they have a spare ball. Spare ball is usually made out of a hard plastic that has very little friction, very smooth surface. Even if you can, and the beauty of that is you can throw it your normal way that you throw a strike shot, which is your most consistent throw. And it's spinning like, like heck, but it just goes straight. It just doesn't go, uh, yes, doesn't you can curve. aim straight it at the pin curve. to get yeah, that right, spare. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you know, once you get to the back end of the lane, that you've got certain things going on with the oil distribution on the surface. How, how, do, you, how do you tell? You know, you just, you're not allowed to walk down there and look at it, or can you read it from the way the balls are moving? The last thing, Gary. Oh. <laughs> All right, so let me go back. So first you have to know yeah. what, 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 the, what the pattern of the oil is that they're putting down. Mm -hmm. Then you have to know how does that pattern change uh, over time as you throw balls, because the ball is picking up oil when yeah. it's going down that slick part of the lane. And that oil is so, so you're actually removing a little oil from the first part of the lane. And in that it's carrying that oil down. So as the night goes on, as the games go on, the oil is getting pushed down the lane and it's getting pushed in the area that, that your ball is curving. All right. So it tends to give you less curve as the night goes on in that area. All right. So a good bowler has to adjust. They, they can't see the oil. Like you pointed out, Gary, hmm. they have to adjust based on what, based on the reaction of the ball. So when the ball is starting to come in light, we say it's, it's not curving as much. We would typically move our feet to the left and aim a little bit to the left. That way we're hitting fresh oil and we're hitting fresh dry lane down, down the last third of the lane. Man. So, so you, you've got to have a lot of experience to be able to read the oil patterns on the lane and, and then have the knowledge to know what will happen. But as, if they as change a the, 
but you just said they changed the oil patterns as well. So just to make it I'm not in the middle of a game. They're just the, they no, set, they start before, with different starter patterns, right? But I'm saying before the game, do you guys get to throw like how many practice throws do you get to throw? Because that's not fair. You're starting a competition and you don't know what the terrain is. Exactly. We have to practice. You know, even in the league, they give us five or ten minutes of practice, and that whole time I'm hunting around. I'm hunting around, adjusting my speed, adjusting my spin, adjusting my aim point to try to find that optimal that optimal place to throw the ball. Yeah, so but that is Gary's, critical to, in practice. To, you have to identify that. To Gary's point, it's not that you can see the oil at all times as the tournament progresses. You are reading what is happening to the balls that are thrown. Yeah. And yes. Judging what the oil distribution is in that moment from the and behavior a good player, of the balls. A good player has to also realize, did that ball react like it did because I threw it a little bit too fast? Or because did I did I get a little extra finger in it and spin it a little bit too much? Uh, but a good player is aware of all that. Mm -hmm. And a good all player right, also has to be accurate enough. It's no it's no use reading what the ball does unless you can throw it in the in the place you're aiming every time. <laughs> make the, you got to make the adjustment. And can you learn something from the way your opponent is throwing yeah, the ball? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yes, yes. Every every uh, every throw is information. Cool. Ooh, concentration. No, it's intense so concentration, isn't it? Oh, you got to just like any sport, you don't want to be too intense the whole time. You got to be focused no. and you got to pay attention and, and observe, but you don't yeah. want to be like, you're not, you're not super intense staring the whole time. Yeah. No, tell but, that to Tom Brady. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so there's a thing called the curveball strategy, which sounds like a baseball term, but it's not, it's, it's applied to temp and bowling. So is that a successful strategy to cope with changing oil patterns? Well, yes, we throw a, any good bowler throws a curve ball to get that that optimal six degree entry angle that's critical you have to curve the ball to have the ball come into the pocket at the good angle and the amount of curve is affected by the oil as the oil chain and as the oil changes over the night you get that the amount of curve changes and you're constantly making adjustments uh, but you're right a curve ball is critical to bowl well i'm sure there's been some 300 games from people that throw the ball straight but it's very rare now these bowling technologies, like the the weight block they put in the ball, that that allows it to get this gyroscopic effect that prevents the oil from building up on one stripe. Mm -hmm. When those when that when that when that technology came out about in the 90s, 1990s, the number the average uh, the bowling averages in leagues and the number of 300s per year increased dramatically. And you know this Wait, is so the problem. tell me exactly what that is. What 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 is <laughs> the blocking the block the block the weight yeah. block? Yeah. So bowling ball again is not a homogeneous sphere. If it were, you would you wouldn't get gyroscopic effects, and the ball would build up a, a a ring or a circumference of oil as it's going down the lane, and that would reduce the friction when it hits the dry part because it's spinning on this oil. So because they're inside the ball, the balls consist of what's called a cover stock. It's usually an inch or so thick of material on the outer part. There's a core inside of that. That's a different material, usually harder, and then inside the core, there's a weight block. And it's as Gary mentioned, it's not always symmetrical. It's 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 like a uh, generally the shape of like a little football, but it has sometimes it has nodular shape. It's they have they have all these patented shapes that the different manufacturers come out come out with for marketing mostly, <laughs> but they have different shapes that are asymmetric, and they're placed in the core. They're cast inside the core in asymmetric directions. And when they drill your ball, uh, there's a little plug that tells them what the axis of this core is. Whoa. So when they drill the holes, they can decide what angle to put these holes at relative to the axis of the core. And that, all that contributes to two things. It contributes to the uh, gyroscopic effects, mm -hmm. and it contributes to what's called the radius of gyration, which we talk about, which you talk about also. I, I can't help wondering, right, because I don't think 10-pin bowling was initially started knowing that you'd oil the lane. So A, who came up with that clever idea? And B, what happens if you don't oil the lane? Mm. Oh, that's great points, Gary. Yeah, the oil originally was to protect the wood, to treat the wood, mm -hmm. and also to limit friction, all right? Because if you if you had a totally dry wood surface, well, you and, end up with a big rut in the middle <laughs> yeah, of the lane. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. it'd be three gutters. Like, <laughs> the ball would be like a trench digger. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, so they first, you know, they, they conditioned the lanes with the oil to treat the wood and also to reduce the friction so the wood wouldn't get damaged too easily. Um, and in the early days, people threw the ball straight. You know, and then, then the oil was there. And then somebody, just like in just like in billiards, one day somebody put a piece of leather on the end of the tip and then they were able to put spin and then they started, they all, a whole new world of shots opened up. Same thing with bowling. Somebody one day said, oh, what if I spin the ball? It's going to slide through the oil and then curve. 
Does that help me? They didn't know at first, but through experience, they learned. It helps a lot. Has there ever been ball. a Bugs Bunny shot where they throw the ball, but the ball doesn't leave their hand and the ball drags them down? <laughs> <laughs> you know, funny you should say that because as uh, you know, I live in Colorado and it's very dry normally, but I played in the tournament this past weekend and uh, there were a lot of people on the bowling lanes and it was getting a little warm. My thumb starts to swell and get a little humid. And then all of a sudden this, the hole gets a little, gets a little uh, sticky. A little snug. <laughs> and I yeah. actually, the, the ball stuck to my thumb uh, uh, once and it, it, it didn't come out of my hand until I, my hand was way up in the air and the ball went flying like 15 feet up in the air vertically. And it pulled me with me and I barely caught myself. See the problem. Uh, if if you get if if you don't catch yourself, you go flying Superman style, and you land in this oil. You go sliding down the lane, just like the ball. <laughs> okay, so that can well, happen. Either that, or you just leave your thumb inside of a ball. <laughs> Ouch! Which, well, it does hurt. We, we'd have to add another law to the cartoon laws of physics to understand what happened there. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we want to learn more about bowling fashions, <laughs> or rather, <laughs> what's up with the shoes? What? <laughs> why? Yeah, and and whose idea was it when I'll just wear shoes that other stank people wore just before me? Like who came up with that idea and why? We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition, all about ten pin bowling and the physics of it. Uh, we got David Alcitor, unknown to us previously when we had him on before talking about billiards, that the man is also a bowling shark. And very impressed by this. Uh, Dave, I want to pick up a point that you started talking about, but I want, to, I want to ask a little more deeply. You're saying today the ball has three components to it in its manufacture. An outer shell, let's call it, like Earth, my analogy is Earth's crust. Okay, an outer shell. Then we have a, a mantle that go inside. But in the core is a thing that's not centered. It's off-center. So... Tell me what would happen if I mounted the ball with on an axis and then spun it. Would it just wobble? Is that what it would do? What's the consequence? What's the spinning consequence to the ball for putting something in there that's off center? Yes, great questions, Neil. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this asymmetry is what enables the gyroscopic effects. All right, and the asymmetry comes from the shape of this core. It also comes from what angle do they drill the holes of your ball. It also comes from what angle do you spin the ball about as you throw it. So the ball is spinning about some axis. The ball has this asymmetry. Friction is acting on the ball. It causes the ball to do this gyroscopic precession or wobble or oscillating rotation, whatever you want to call it. And that, that's, that creates what's called track flare. The oil doesn't build up under circumference. The oil creates these tracks that are flared out and separated. And when you get your ball back after you throw it, you can actually see these oil patterns on the ball. It's called track flare. And you can see these different stripes of oil in the ball at these weird angles all around the ball. Oh, my God. That's why you, every time you watch bowling on television, which, by the way, I never do. OK, but because <laughs> I because I have a life and you no know, Saturday afternoons for me are very busy. But um, <laughs> but every time you see these guys approach um, the lane, they have like this cloth and they're, it, they're, they're, they're like polishing their ball, which I had no idea why they did that. But so they're removing the oil? Bingo. They're removing the oil. You want, you want that ball to be that. Uh, generate as much friction as possible. You also want your throw to be consistent. So you don't want to have oil on it and have the oil build up over time. You want to get rid of that oil. Man. I just thought they really liked those balls. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, that guy is proud of that bowling ball. Look at him. He's just like, yeah, baby, it's okay. Daddy's got you, baby. Daddy's got you. <laughs> and they want to they want to shine it up so they can see their pretty face in the reflection oh, too. My God. <laughs> so n knowing this is happening and the ball, the, the weight block is offset, I will now have to structure my technique to bring the best out of that particular setup on a ball. So it's always been a one-handed thing for me watching bowling any, at any time. But now it's it's the the successful way is a two-handed bowl, which sounds a little bit like my uh, mother would do, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the two-handed throw is actually a fairly new thing, and it's not it's actually not widespread. It yet. is not new. Yeah. 
No, Chuck did it when he was a baby. Chuck I was going to tell you, that was invented by three-year-olds. Okay. okay? <laughs> so, yeah, next yeah, thing you're going to be next thing yeah. you're tell me is they put gates up over the gutters. <laughs> 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 but so there's a there's something called fingertip grip which now that sounds, is something that is something yeah. a fingertip grip is something that's that's prevalent everybody yeah. any decent bowler they don't stick their their middle finger and an index finger all the way into the ball up to the middle knuckle they only put the fingertips in or right, in the span the span of the holes the fingertips are, are much farther from the thumb than the balls you would see in a bowling alley. The balls you can use, you know, the fingers are the finger holes are pretty close together. But any good bowler, the ball, the fingers are further apart. So you just part, you just put your fingertips in the ball, the index finger and middle finger, fingertips, then your thumb. That gives you a wider span. And when you want to apply spin, those fingers are the last things that come out. The, the two fingers, index finger and middle Does finger. Does that mean the holes aren't drilled as deeply then? That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and so that gives you, it's like you're flicking the ball at yes. the very end. You're kind of giving it a whip. Ooh. It's like a whip effect on the ball. Okay, so That's if the right. holes aren't as deep, that means the balls are more symmetric. Well, the thumb hole's still deep. but okay. and, and, and yeah, but the, when they drill the holes in the ball, it does create asymmetry. And mm -hmm. but they when they when they these weight blocks, part of the issue is they, they put it off center slightly. So when they drill the holes, it, it tends to balance it a little bit. So that's that that's kind of that's balanced, but most balls are actually not perfectly balanced. Um, but that's okay. <laughs> but here's something in Vegas: proper dice have holes drilled for the numbers and refilled with another sort of putty that has the same density as the material that they drilled out. So so the numbers are in white dots and the dice are red, typically, right? And so, so now there's no side that weighs more than any other because of that. If you have dice where it's just holes and that's it, it's a non-symmetric dice. And yes. it will not give you equal probabilities. And they yeah. go to extremes to make sure those dice are balanced as well. Not, not right. in my yeah. neighborhood, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the question, we, Dave, the question we have to ask is, why do bowling shoes look like they've been stolen from a 15th century medieval festival? And, and who just, and who convinced us that I should agree to stick my feet into yeah. somebody else's stank feet that have been there right mm. before I arrived? And and, and what is the incidence of athlete's foot amongst bowlers? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, there's a bowling alleys have a thing called Lysol. <laughs> they spray okay. Lysol in these shoes to help 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 limit that, Chuck. But okay. answering Gary's question, why do they look Notice like they do? Notice he didn't say he, he sprays it in to stop it. Yeah. He says he sprays it to limit it. I caught that. <laughs> you caught that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. a uh, that's a very very important distinction, Neil. That's right. <laughs> you know, any any good bowler has their own shoes, obviously, but uh, yeah. you know, the general yeah. population doesn't have their own bowling shoes. You can't expect that, so you have to provide them. You have to provide them. And it well, isn't it awesome, Gary, that they look so retro cool. They don't look like you know, medieval English stuff. They look like retro cool American dude. No. Nah. Yeah, yeah that's what they tell every time yeah. I see him, I'm waiting for Richie Cunningham to come <laughs> pop into a door. <laughs> so the, the thing, Dave, they've got, there's got to be a reason why you have to have those shoes. You can't just come in and bowl in your own sneakers or something. What is there something special about these shoes apart from the fact they look like they're from the 15th century? Very special. The uh, the part under your toes is actually a piece of leather that allows All the right. foot to slide more easily on the wood surface on the lane, and the heel is actually more like a rubber. All right. And that serves as your break. <laughs> it's not really sticky rubber, but it's kind of a hard rubber. But if you try to bowl like in tennis shoes or something, you're going to you're not going to slide. You're going to stick and you might do the Superman thing into the oil. You don't want to do that. So you want to you want to slide in toward that foul line where you release the ball and the bowling shoes allow you to do that. And the, the heel, the rubber heel lets you put on the brakes if you're sliding too much. Wow. So it's all about the friction. Just yes. the right. Not too much, not too little friction. Exactly. Mm hmm. Now, and, good and bowlers, now, they have a sense. They have a sense for. We kind of do this kind of instinctively, using that heel. Like if we're sliding too much, we can kind of sense that immediately. We don't think about it, and then we apply a little more pressure to the heel. So it all happens, you know, with experience. You you take advantage of that leather and that rubber to control your slide optimally. Because the surface gets dirty sometimes. Those teenagers that throw the ball with two hands, Chuck. Sometimes they they get their sticky fingers all over stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they get the lanes dirty. And well, that's that's why I, that's why they shouldn't be allowed in the alley. I, <laughs> I, under, I understand that you know bowling is supposed to be a family sport, but some just for certain family members, you know. But, but how about if you bowl while you're still holding your beer? Is that allowed? 
Uh, no. <laughs> in fact, uh, <laughs> a good bowlers don't like when you have anything, any food uh, or drink in the lane area. You know, you have to be in the right. back. You have to be back where the carpet is, you know, and by the counter. They don't yeah, want you they, to have any kind of Bowling would go products. out of business if they didn't allow eating the, eating the, the, the what's with the, the, the chips and dip. And yeah. the pizza. Uh, yeah, 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 you need Yeah, those. but there's lots of places to eat and drink behind the lanes. Nachos. Yeah. I have nachos. And what about the pins, Dave? Because... They are getting brutalized every time you throw a 16, 15 pound ball down the lane. How are you ensuring that their integrity is there? Because they just, I mean, what are they made of now? Are they still made of wood? Well, they were forever. You know, bowling's pretty old. It's like, it's literally thousands of years old. <laughs> the Egyptians had a form of bowling. All right. And, but for a long time, it was made out of wood and they were turned on a lathe to give them that, that distinctive S shape. Uh, and the wood pins, you know, they, they get chipped, they get cracked, you know, that, and they have to be replaced, you know, fairly often. But nowadays they are synthetic, a really tough material. And the, the good thing about the synthetic pins is they're more consistent. You know, wood has grain and wood has different properties in different directions and on different portions. But the synthetic pins, they're more, you know, they're more consistent and uniform. And that's probably contributed to the higher scores over the years as well. You know, if things are more consistent and the, these machines that put down the oil, if they're better, if the, if the machines that spot the pins in the correct places are more accurate with tolerances, if all that stuff is better, then we can bowl better. And that's what's happened over the years. Scores have gotten I, higher. I'd say How rare is a 300? How rare is a 300? Uh, well, even league bowlers like myself bowl 300s every once in a while. You know, yeah. so uh, uh, this, this past weekend, I bowled uh, a 279. I didn't ask about a 270. I said 300. That's not a 300. No, 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 don't play that game. I don't know how hard it is. So the 379, I had one shot where I threw it what I thought was perfect. Yeah. And I had what's called a ringing 10 pin. The 10 pin's the one in the corner. And it And the pin in front of that is the six pin. And if the entry angle isn't exactly perfect, and you don't hit it in exactly the right place, that six pin just wraps around the 10. Sometimes it touches it and the 10 pin just ringing in place. It's just wild. It's ringing in place. And that yeah. was the only mistake. I had all strikes except this one ringing 10. So it's very ah, hard. That's why they call it a perfect game. I know. If you want to be yeah. perfect, you, you got to be perfect. perfect. If it's not perfect, it's not perfect. Wait, that's wait. Right. So, so correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. So to bowl a 300, you have to roll 12 consecutive strikes. Is exactly. That okay. So has anyone bowled two 300 games in a row? Yes, Ooh. people have bowled three, 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 300 games in a row. That gives you a, a perfect series of 900. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay, so uh, okay. now how about now in your based case? on that, I'm just going to say it ain't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I'm just saying I've never heard of a pitcher who's thrown three perfect games in a row. Yeah, I think oh, you, bowling you, is easier. Analogizing to baseball now. Okay. I think it's easier than getting a, a hole-in-one in golf, for example. It's easier than throwing a perfect game in, in baseball. Uh, but it's still hard. It's yeah. still so hard. hard. Yeah. So, so for you, uh, so how many perfect games have you bowled in your life? Only one. But wow. I've had many. Wow. I've had many two seven. I didn't ask you about the other games. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's like saying that's like Chuck. How many standing ovations have you had? <laughs> well, one time four people in the back stood up, <laughs> the back. but then I saw that they were just going to a concession stand. <laughs> 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 All right, so here I'll make here, I'll make you feel a little better. You ready? So, how many strikes in a row had you thrown before it and after it, so that we can now get the total number of consecutive strikes that you've ever thrown? Ooh, yeah, and we, we keep track of that. We know, we know what that number is. Mine is mine is eighteen. So I threw eighteen Whoa! strikes in a row. Yeah, yeah, very good. And one time wow. I threw one time I threw sixteen strikes in a row and didn't get a three hundred. In fact. Both games were like in the 250s or 260s, which is like mediocre. <laughs> I don't get it. How can you, if uh, yeah, 12 I mean, in a I, row is a 300, how does 16 not get you? Over two games. Over two games. Oh. Oh, like eight the last eight. Yeah, like the last eight. Yeah, the last eight of the first game, the first eight of the second game. Oh, right. yeah. Right. You know what that's like, Chuck? The baseball analogy here is where you have multiple relief pitchers combining to pitch a no-hitter. Right. That's what exactly. that is. It's there like, you go. You staple right. it together. You staple it yes. together. So, yeah, yeah, so no one pitcher gets a no-hitter, but they all sort of participated. So yeah. have it, has it ever happened to you where it's the last throw of the game? Because the 10th frame, you just get three throws. Yes. But if you pick up the spare. But has it ever happened where on the in the 10th frame, 
the last throw, you screw up your perfect game. No, I've never done that, but that is very common. Very I have common. a friend who did that, and he got 299. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, you can get a 299, 298, 297. But if, oh. you miss, if your miss is somewhere in the middle of the game, you get a 279. That's the highest you can get if your miss is in the middle of the game, 279. Gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Okay, go back to the lane. Then you've got the arrows because I mean the lane itself is a series of I don't want to call it boards, planks, but boards. boards. There yeah. you go. And they all have these little arrows in there, and I'm obviously they they're used as guidelines. Are there any other kind of markers on the real estate that you can use to key off and, and get a better strike? Yeah, there are, are other markers. There's a there's a row of uh, little circle marks in front of the arrows. The arrows are about 15 feet down the lane, and that's what most bowlers use to aim. You know, you want to be you don't want to be gazing down at your ball or gazing at the foul line. You want to be gazing at your distant tar target about 15 feet down the lane. So that's what most bowlers are looking at. They're trying to hit a certain board. You know, between the arrows, there's boards. You can actually see the individual boards of the lane. There's uh, five boards per arrow, and there's seven arrows across the lane. So there's um, there's thirty five. Yeah, there's, there's let's see, there's there's forty, there's thirty nine boards total. <laughs> oh, okay. There's seven arrows, but there's two gaps on each side of the arrows. Anyway, on each on, side. Okay. The, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, most bowlers are aiming at a particular board. The boards are about a one inch wide, and so good bowlers can can hit their target within about an inch, fairly fairly reliably. Uh, two inches. The, the pros are within an inch. You know, league bowlers like me, like me, we can get within two inches pretty reliably the whole night. We can hit our target within two inches, but if your speed is off a little bit, if you throw it a little too slow, it curves too soon and you don't get a strike. You throw a little too fast, it curves too late. If you don't release your fingers the exact same way, you don't get the same amount of spin. So you don't get the same curve. So there's so many variables. Isn't it I amazing? Am, this this I lane am is- almost, I am almost developing a healthy respect for bowling. Well, thank you, Chuck, because I was I was uh, I was perceiving a very strong disrespect earlier. Yeah, I got to tell you the truth. I'm gonna be no, honest. I felt, it, I felt it too, Dave. Dave. I, I, I didn't like him dissing. I didn't like him dissing my two seventy nines, man. That's uh, oh god. No, no this is. I, I have to tell you, Dave, that I think a lot of people suffer from this bias, where because everyone can go bowling, people are under the impression that everyone can bowl. Yeah. You know, or bowl mm -hmm. well, or it's not as difficult as you just uh, let us see, which it seems like it's a game of true precision. But at the same time, this is the beauty of bowling and billiards. You can you can be terrible and still have a great time. That's what I love about billiards and pool. Anybody can enjoy it. That's yeah. a beautiful thought. Has anyone tried to sort of change the game? Um, make it more, you know, sexier, more interesting, or is it as good as it's ever going to get as we find it right now? Well, like most sports and games, we don't want to change anything, right? In fact, these new balls that kind of revolutionize the game and kind of increase the scores a lot, you know, purists don't like that because it changes the game and then you can't compare today's performance to the past performance. So we want the game to stay the same. But having said that, technology has changed a little bit and technique has changed somewhat. We, we briefly mentioned the two-handed bowling, yeah. All right? So most bowlers had their fingertips in the ball and their thumb in the ball. But these two-handers now, they only put their fingertips in the ball. And they need the other hand to help support the ball so it doesn't fall off you know, when they're about to release it. They have to help support it. So they go down the lane holding the ball with both hands. They had their fingertips in the ball only. And when they release it, they can put way more spin on the ball because they're not hampered by the thumb. Everything's about those two fingers that spin the heck out of the ball and give a tremendous well, plus rev rate. Your, your other hand can help spin it also. Is that correct? No, the other hand is just there for support. To, it, for support, They, they okay. don't use that because, you know, when you're releasing the ball, the other hand uh, comes off. You just yeah. use the other hand to get you to that release point. Mm -hmm. Then the fingers do everything. So how about this? Because I just invented a, a version of bowling in my head, uh, uh -oh. which is you take <laughs> the hardest shots and you uh, rank which shots are most difficult, and then the pin configuration, you can choose to get the most points. So, of course, the 710 would be worth the most, and, uh, you know, uh, the one pin by itself would be worth, wor worth the least. And then you can figure out these configurations, and then you get to actually choose which ones you will try in order to 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 score more points. Interesting. I like it. I you like know, it. So, yeah. So basically, each setup has a different difficulty level. 
Yes. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Gary. And if you get if you get behind <laughs> if you get behind the game, you can take on the more challenging uh, patterns. Right. Yeah. Wow. Right. So you can all you can always come back and win depending on which level of difficulty you choose t- uh, uh, to to roll your ball. I'm going to give you a little credit for that, even though you disrespected me earlier, Chuck. I'm going to say I'm going to give you some credit. That's a good idea, man. <laughs> that is. <laughs> I think, you, I think you've taken the, the sport in a new direction, Chuck. Dr. Dave, it's great to have you back. And I'm, I'm afraid to ask you what else you are a world's expert in. Yeah. Uh, we might find that out on another invite. Street uh, Dice is next. <laughs> Street Dice. <laughs> Chuck and Gary, always good to have you, man. Always yeah, It is. Thank you. So that's a wrap on our Star Talk Sports Edition. Bowling. How to be an expert. Know some physics. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the takeaway from this. Yes, no some physics. Go. All right, and have a mom who used to work in a bowling alley. <laughs> Combine those two, it's, you're, you're a winner every time. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up.